Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Betsy Stevenson. Betsy is an associate professor of public policy at the University of Michigan and a research associate with the National Bureau of Economic Research. She was the chief economist at the U.S. Department of Labor from 2010 to 2011 and also served in President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors 2013 to 2015. Betsy is also the author of a new economics textbook that will be out soon titled The Principles of Economics. And today she joins us to talk about challenges in the labor market as well as some of her research. Betsy, welcome to the show. It's good to talk to you. Oh, it's a real treat to get you on. We have followed your work and it's always neat to talk to researchers and, and, and get their perspective on what they're doing, what they're writing. I want to begin as I do with all my guests and ask, how did you get into economics? Uh, that is a, a great question. And, you know, for me, I always joke that I was born an economist. Um, hmm. And it and by that, I mean that I, I had, you know, really ever since I was little, I thought about how incentives shape people's behavior. And I questioned whether the incentives that we were setting were the right ones. I think I confused my parents who have no background or interest in economics. <laughs> um, because when I was 16 and I got my first job, I said, look at this Social Security payroll taxes. And my parents said, oh, yeah, you know, they're important. They pay for Social Security. And I said, yeah, for you, but for kids, these aren't going to be one of my highest earning years. This isn't going to contribute at all to my Social Security payments. <laughs> and uh, my and I was like, so I was like, what? You know, I, I had this recognition of both the details of how the system worked, but also that uh, you know that that it it actually mattered. It mattered whether you were getting a benefit that was tied to the payment or or not getting a benefit. And so I think that these. These kinds of, of questions and how we should structure how we should structure society to sh- to you know create the right set of incentives um, and how people respond to those incentives is something where I just I've been curious about my whole life and when I got to college and started actually taking economics classes I felt like I had finally found my home. And people who thought like me, who under who thought about the world the way I did, and uh, you know, it, it grew from there. So you found your tribe in economics. You're naturally wired to be one. That's that's great. <laughs> now you went to Harvard. Is that correct? For my PhD. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. And then, and then from there you went to academia, and then at, at some point in your career you become the chief economist at the Department of Labor. So tell us, what was that job like? What did you do there? What were some of the issues you faced? Um, well, you know, first of all, I actually do just have to tell you something because sure. I'm very rare as an economist. Um, I finished my PhD and went to the private sector. Okay. And I got to the private sector and I liked my job. I worked with big data. I gave companies advice coming out of interpreting the data about strategic investments and what they should be doing moving forward. But I thought... This is really boring. It's not as <laughs> exciting as economic research. Mm-hmm. And so I actually went back and did an, and reapplied to academic jobs. And I went back to academia. And, you know, I, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of my advisors who are cringing right now. And they're like, you're not supposed to tell people that that worked. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but it did work. Um, it turned out I think there was nothing better than actually stepping away and learning what my true passion was. Um, to make me a, a very happy academic. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you were asking, what was it like going to the Department of Labor as the chief economist? I mean, the only way to answer that question is to really put it in, you know, the the context of the situation we were in, which was, you know, this very massive increase in unemployment mm-hmm. and becoming the chief economist of the Department of Labor at a time when, you know, nine to 10 percent of the public well, the workforce was unemployed. And that was, you know, what I thought about, you know, from the moment I woke up to the minute my head to hit the pillow and probably also what I dreamed about, because that's an enormous hardship for people. And there's an expectation that the government needs to do everything they can to reduce the pain of that hardship to get the economy back and 
the right place and uh, to to reduce the permanent effects on people as much as possible. And so it was a, you know, it was a difficult time to be chief economist, but it was also a really important and meaningful time to be chief economist at the Department of Labor. I imagine there were a lot of exciting things going on during that time. I have to ask you, as the former chief economist of the Department of Labor, what is your favorite labor market metric, right? So there's been a lot of criticisms of the unemployment rate. It's kind of like the headline measure. Everyone looks at it. Also, the employment uh, number is also a popular one. But a lot of discussion, as you know, about other metrics, better measures of slack in the labor market. So if you had to pick one or two, what would be your preferred measure of the labor market? Well, you know, I understand a lot of the criticisms of the unemployment rate, Mm -hmm. but, you know, I think that people need to think about what it would have been like to be entering the Great Depression when we didn't actually measure unemployment. Mm, Good point. And, you know, I'm I'm grateful that we measure unemployment and we measure in a consistent way. Mm -hmm. It may not be perfect. Nothing's going to be perfect, but it's consistent. And that's going to give us a really important glimpse into what's going on in the economy. And so I, I, I always feel really sort of, you know, I feel terrible when people are bashing the unemployment rate because it does so much for us. And, you know, the people who conceived of it did think really hard about what it is we were measuring and how to measure something consistently over time. But that doesn't, you know, I, I also think that it's important that you look at a range of, uh, you know, you said, what's my favorite piece of data? My favorite thing is to put together a large amount of data and say, is it all telling me the same story? Okay. Do I look at what's happening with participation? Do I look at what's happening with, um, you know, with hiring? Do we look at what's happening with GDP? Mm-hmm. Is it is it all telling us the same story? But I did want to highlight to you, I do have a favorite statistic that people don't pay as much attention to, and that's the quits rate. So I, I really like to look when the, Jolt's numbers come out on the job openings and labor turnover survey. You know, the first thing I look at is how many people quit last month. And it's not, it might sound like a depressing statistic, but it's not. It's a really optimistic statistic because people only quit jobs when they either have a better opportunity or they're confident that they can find a better opportunity or they can find another job. And, you know, in September 2009, the number of people quitting in a given month or in the month of September dropped to 1.6 million. And, you know, just this past May, 3.2 million people quit jobs. So Mm. it's double, twice as many people are willing to quit. And that's a really good sign of the strengthening economy because it means people feel like either they already have a better opportunity in hand or they say, I get something else I need to do. I need to leave this job, but I am confident I'm going to be able to get another one. And so that's a really good metric that helps, you know, us understand how do workers really feel about the labor market they're in. Okay. So Betsy, here's my new favorite metric. I've really latched on to the prime age employment to population ratio or um, what Jordan Wiseman at Slate calls. I like, I like the way he frames it. He calls it the working age employment rate. And that one, you know, kind of accounts for demographics. So you can't say, you know, we're well, looking at old people or young people. It's, it's the working age employment rate. It's the m- number of, you know, the percent of the population in that group that's actually employed. And prior to the uh, Great Recession, it was about 80 percent. And then it fell down to about 75. And it's gone. It's near 78 now. It's, so it's almost back to where it was. It's not quite. And when I look at a measure like that, I, I see a continually uh, a steady improvement all the way from the bottom of the recession in 2009. And that tells me there's, you know, there's a lot of progress made, but maybe there's still some more that could be made. So it leads me to this question. Do you think we have truly reached full employment or, or, or is there any more slack left in the labor market? So, I mean, the question of how much slack there is mm-hmm. in the the labor market's obviously been a really big one for a long time. And and I really felt like um, that there has, you know, for the last two years, I thought there was room for more people to come into the labor force. And, um, you know, in my last year at CEA in 2015, I was, you know, strong, a strong 
proponent that there was a lot of slack left in the labor market. And I think, uh, you know, I can say that uh, the last two years has shown that to be true. Um, businesses have done an incredible amount of hiring with unemployment rates that, mm -hmm. you know, in, in 2013, people talked about, you know, uh, um, that, you know, it's sort of a full employment rate of 5.4, 5.2%. And we've seen that we've been able to sustain something uh, much lower than that. And I, you know, the, uh, you know, I think it's still possible that there's some slack left in the labor market. I mean, for one thing, if you look at unemployment rates by education, they're not as low as we've seen in the past. You know, the unemployment rate for college graduates is 2.4%, which sounds low, mm -hmm. but, you know, in, you know, in previous peaks, we've seen unemployment rates uh, for college graduates drop to, you know, 1.6%. So, you know, if you, if you look at that, it does still look like there's some movement, um, for the unemployment rate itself to come down by, by education. And, uh, you know, there's certainly some room, at, room to pull people back into the labor market. And what we've learned the last two years is that the stronger economies are necessary to pull the sort of hardest to employ workers back into the economy or the most reluctant mm -hmm. uh, workers back into the economy. And, and so this last year, we've made a lot of progress not employing our you know, our most skilled, most likely to work people, but pulling in uh, people with less skill and uh, people who've had, you know, weaker attachments to the labor force. And so you know, that having long recoveries is really important to get those folks back into the labor force. And, you know, I think another year of us, you know, continuing strong economy will continue to pull more people back in. Now, that said, you know, we're still sort of trying to figure out why it is that their the prime age uh, participation rate has fallen, and what it is that we could do to stop that. You know, the there's sort of two things going on that are really separate between men and women. Male participation's been on a downward trend for 50 years or more, actually, since the 1950s, and um, you know, it, at some at some point, we'd like to see that downward trend stop. Mm -hmm. And then for female employment, you know, we saw a peak in women's labor force participation at the end of the 1990s. And, you know, we what we haven't. You know, the, it's not that this is necessarily an explanation for this, but what we've seen is that it hasn't peaked in other countries and other countries have done more to support combining work and families over the last 20 years. You know, Australia's added paid parental leave programs. Uh, other countries have, you know, changed their policies in ways that have tried to, you know, reduce uh, discrimination against um, women uh, during pregnancy that have made childcare more affordable and available and higher quality childcare. These are a bunch of changes that have been happening elsewhere and we haven't been doing those. So I, the counterfactual is pretty clear that if we had done more to support working families, we'd have higher female labor force participation today. Um, that still doesn't necessarily explain why it peaked and has been dropping um, and, you know, and how much it will recover without us adopting those kind of policies. You know, there's definitely progress still to be made, but it's interesting you bring up Australia as kind of a counterfactual because I often bring that up as a counterfactual for the Great Recession, what could have been. I mean, Australia did not experience a Great Recession like we did. In fact, it, it didn't really even have a recession, but it also did have a housing boom, credit boom, you know, all, all the things that we had in the U.S., and it weathered uh, the 2008-2009 period relatively well. I attribute that in part to maybe some luck, but also to the, the central bank in Australia doing a better job. They never hit the zero lower bound. Uh, they tolerate a little higher inflation. And, and I often, this point to them is, you know, things could have been done differently, maybe, maybe better. And you've worked at this, the Council of Economic Advisors. You've, you've been in the policy world. 
Um, you've written a textbook. If you could sit back, take all of everything you know now, sit back and play, you know, economic dictator, go back in time, you could call the shots. Anything you would have done differently policy-wise, uh, 2008, 2009, and, and the years following that? Um, yeah, so I, I think it's not necessarily Australia because, you know, Australia has a very commodities-based economy and mm-hmm. they had the benefit of a commodities boom at it. Uh, that really helped them. And so I wouldn't wish that on the U S because the a diverse economy is a good one. Sure. But, uh, but there are some things I would do, would have done differently. I do think, you know, in hindsight, we needed a bigger stimulus and, and that, you know, it's a great example of the lags in economic data. You know, we have to make real time decisions about how to respond to a recession and, what we were seeing at the time was that, gee, there's a lot of people losing their jobs for not as big a contraction in GDP. You know, I I remember people talking about the puzzle and just how many Mm -hmm. people were losing jobs given the contraction. And then it turned out, well, no, actually the problem was the contraction was just measured and it was much bigger than we thought. And so the stimulus wasn't big enough given that contraction. But I think it's not just, you know, the question isn't just how big was the stimulus. Mm -hmm. That, you know, we had a time where we had an enormous amount of slack resources. And that's a time where, you know, where we had workers who don't have jobs, we have capital that's not being used. And that's a time where I want to see my government doing all the investment that it needs to do in public infrastructure. That, you know, that is the cheapest time. You know, I like to see me, uh, I'd like to get bang for my buck when it comes to my tax dollars. And that's really the most efficient time for the government to invest in infrastructure. And I think it was a real loss that we didn't do enough of that. And that, you know, we're still talking about a need for infrastructure investment at a time where unemployment has fallen to 4.3%. And, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of businesses operating at capacity. So there's not the, um, you know, available uh, we don't see the same kind of available resources. I think that was a real mistake. And that, uh, you know, I'd like to see, you know, our government do a better job of being uh, able to manage both borrowing during a recession in order to make investments and then paying some of that debt back during booms in order to, you know, have fiscal discipline. Yeah. Well, they definitely, you know, Missed the opportunity for great financing terms, although long-term yields still have been kept relatively low. But they, as you said, investment spending would have been a great bargain when you had all these unemployed resources during that time. Infrastructure spending could have taken place. I've even heard you know some people you know on the right mention that you know if, if infrastructure spending is what you need, then do it when it's best priced. What about the monetary policy? Because I'm more of a monetary macro kind of guy, and, and one of the criticisms I've had has been the Fed not hitting its inflation target. Um, it's, it was set at 2% in 2012, um, but there's but there's been papers and there's evidence that suggests that it was implicitly falling one before then. And since June 2009, it's only once really crossed 2%. For the most of the time, it, it's been below that. It's averaged about 1.5%. Do you think that was a drag on the recovery? Well, so I I mean, I would agree with you. And you know, I've said that I think they should treat it like a target, not a ceiling. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it looked like there was a lot of treating it like a ceiling. Like, you know, as long as we don't go over it, it's good. And it's like, no, no, the, the goal of an inflation target is you're trying to average that. You're trying to hit 2% on average, at not one and a half on average with and you know, they, you know, I, I think the challenge for the Fed is that they were at a time where they needed to use a lot of unconventional policy tools. And it's easy for us in hindsight to look back and say they should have done more. So I can easily look back at that and say, look, they didn't hit the inflation target and we could have recovered faster if they had done more. But I'm also cognizant of the political reality that the Fed is, while the Fed has independence, it needs to be cautious about not taking actions that, or it needs to be cautious when it takes actions that are going to rattle policymakers. And given you know their 
their need to use such unconventional monetary policy tools, I think that there was some realistic caution in making sure that they sort of stayed on the cautious side of using those tools. Again, in hindsight, I wish they had used them more aggressively. But, you know, mm. if if that had resulted in, say, more, you know, a, a loss of independence for the for the Fed due to, you know, political you know, poli- the due to political pressure and Congress getting upset about it, then that I don't think it would have been worth that cost. So I, I don't know if that sort of makes sense, but mm-hmm. I agree with you that I wish they had done more. If they had done more, the they're not doing more did hold the recovery back. But at the same time, their political risks, not just economic risks, when they take action. And, you know, I think that they are correctly weighing those political risks as well as the economic risk. Yeah, there's there's no doubt that the political pressures played a role in the response that they had. I mean, we all recall Ben Bernanke's grilling on QE2. Um, even within the Fed, there was pushback from certain regional Fed presidents about doing the programs. So there's undoubtedly political pressure that they had to guard themselves against and kind of walk through the minefield. Um, but at the same time, they did r- something very radical. QE, right? QE two was was very unpopular. QE three, and and I just you know again this is Monday morning quarterbacking. Like you said, it's, it's going back in hindsight. But all the political capital they spent on those programs, had they spent that up front on a program, you know, had they done QE three up front, had they done something more aggressive up front, um, that would have allowed them to hit their inflation target. And and not, in my view, slow the recovery. Uh, I I I probably take a strong view on this. I I think, you know, there's this work by Paul Krugman's '98 paper, Gotti Ergotson, Michael Woodford. They talk about how QE, if it's temporary, which it seems to ultimately be, it's not going to pack as much of a punch as it otherwise could. So I, I guess my point here is, I wish they'd spent their political capital up front on something much more aggressive that would have allowed them to have hit their two percent inflation target. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I just said, I, I, I don't, I don't disagree with that, but I, I also understand how hard, you know, what they were doing is, and we're still in a place where I think we've learned a lot about monetary Mm -hmm. policy and, you know, the Fed has been trying to update their tools and figure out what they're going to do going forward. And they still face a lot of political pressure for reasons that, you know, frankly baffle me, you know, the, they're, you know, they, they've somehow in the last few years become a more political entity than they want to be, than is good for the economy for them to be. And we need to get them back in the shadows in some sense, because they need, you know, this is, work that should be, you know, done without, I mean, the whole reason we have independent, we have central bank independence is so that they can take a long run perspective and do what's best for the country in the long run without short run political pressures. And they seem to be facing more short uh, run political pressures than I think they were facing prior to this recession. Yeah. Now, with all these changes said, you've just written a textbook, and, and as you mentioned you, to me earlier, that you finished your section on macroeconomics. The book won't come out till next year, I think you said. But in writing this section, I wonder what it was like. You know, you have these pa- this past decade almost of, of crisis, response, new programs, political pressures, all things we've talked about. What was it like writing that macroeconomic section? So, you know, the principles of micro and macro textbook mm-hmm. and in principles haven't changed. You know, the basic things we all learned when we took our first economics course, thinking about opportunity cost, how we need to think at the margin, how in, you know, incentives are shaped by people weighing costs and benefits, how our choices are linked to one another and impact one another. Like so these sort of basic ideas of economics, um, are true and weren't at all um, 
challenged, I think, by the by the recession. But there there was something important we learned, which is that economists had not paid enough attention to the role of the financial sector. So I do think it's important for students, even in their very first principles of economics macro course, to learn more about the role of the financial sector. That's also important to us because our goal is to write a book that helps students learn the tools of economics in a way that helps them become better decision makers in their own life. And in order to be a good decision maker in your own life, you need to understand the financial sector so that you can adequately prepare for retirement, make savings and borrowing decisions. So, you know, there, I, I think that increased dedication to thinking about investment in the financial sector is is a place that's good for students and is a reflection of the reality of the real world. I, the place where the biggest changes had to happen were, though, in the monetary policy step, yes. because monetary policy is different. You know, you and I went to school and we learned that the Fed sets the federal funds rate by buying and selling treasury sec- uh, securities. They don't do that. And that's not how they set the Fed funds rate anymore. And it was funny because, you know, I've looked at a lot of books and even books that have recently updated and they you know, still describe these open market operations of uh, buying and selling treasury securities. And, you know, in reality, the important thing the Fed does to set the Fed funds rate is they pay interest on reserves and uh, they borrow money from banks paying an interest rate to them through their overnight reverse repurchase agreements. So it's, it's all actually a bit simpler. The Fed pays an interest rate that sets a floor on interest rates. And then they also lend to people through the discount window. So they effectively sandwich in rates. Mm-hmm. But it is it is like a completely different chapter than other intro chapters because that's not what the Fed used to do. And of course, we also have to talk about inflation targeting and the zero lower bound and all the issues that are associated with modern monetary policy. Mm-hmm. Or I shouldn't give out. Sorry, that has a proper noun. I shouldn't have said use that <laughs> word. But all the things that are associated with monetary policy in the modern era, mm-hmm. um, those things, I think they're important because I don't think they're changing. It's not like the zero lower bound is going to go away anytime soon. Okay, so it sounds like you are incorporating some of the new developments. I mean, you, you mentioned the corridor system for the interest on reserves and the discount rate. So those are the things that have. have you know, emerged since the crisis that are, I think, important that you know, these undergrads see. Now, tell us again when the book comes out exactly. Oh, so it it's actually not out this coming academic year, and not even out the it and not even out the next fall. So it, it's a 2019 book. Okay. Well, any any of the teachers who may be listening should get consider this book co-authored by you and Justin Wolfers. So um, that's another option to consider. Well, let's let's move on to a, a topic that we've had on the show uh, quite a bit, and that's we discuss, and that's the slowdown in, in potential GDP. And there's been you know, many stories given for it. There's a productivity slowdown, and that, that seems to be true in the data despite all the innovation out there. Uh, there's also, as you've alluded to earlier, a slowdown in the labor force growth. There's demographics. There's, there's o- older generations retiring. Uh, but also, maybe it's a small part of the story, but there is this part of the story that prime age working individuals, and you mentioned this earlier as well, are not uh, participating in as much as they were before. And, and some attribute that to cyclical reasons, others attribute that to more structural long-term reasons. And I've compiled a list of different explanations, some of them coming from you, and I want to work through them with you and get your take on them. And I want to begin with a really fun article that you had in Bloomberg View, and the title of it was "Manly Men Need to Do More Girly Jobs." So, so speak to us about that. What what is it about manly men and masculinity that may be putting a, a damper on our growth? Well, you know, we have you hear a lot of people complaining about a loss of jobs, mm-hmm. and what we really have going on is a lot of jobs being created, and you know, a lot of jobs being destroyed. That's the way the economy works. The Actually, a dynamic economy should create, you know, destroy lots and lots of jobs and should create lots and lots of jobs. But right now, we have a sectoral set of sectoral shifts going on. And again, we have always had sectoral shifts. You know, we 
you know, everybody always gives like a classic example, like people used to make buggy whips and they used to make horse drawn carriages and they don't make those anymore. And that's okay. Um, but so we have these sectoral shifts, but right now our sectoral shifts are very gender specific in the sense that, um, we have a lot of jobs being lost in occupations that used to be extremely male dominated. Um, so occupations with like 80% or more of the workers being male. And so, and where we see a lot of the growth is in occupations where, you know, more than 50% of the workers are women. And that is creating some challenges. So it's not that there's not enough jobs. It's that the jobs that are being created are not the jobs that all people want to take. And I, you know, for, you know, for decades, I've heard economists talk about how, you know, the goods producing sector has been in decline for decades. And so for decades, I've heard economists say men just need to go into service sector jobs like women, they need to become nurses. And they're not doing that. And so it it caused me to stop and think, you know, why aren't they doing it? And to realize that there is an identity issue that we're going to have to confront as we reconceive these jobs, because we can't ask men to go into stereotypically female jobs without addressing the fact that that's a challenge to their masculinity. And I think one of the things that that really struck me was when women started going into the workforce, there was a real effort put by everyone to try to preserve sort of female identity. And I, I jokingly talk about there, you know, there was a, a, a commercial where they would sing a song about how you could go to work and, you know, you could bring home the bacon, but you could still fry it up in the pan and you could wear this <laughs> perfume and you can never, the, you know, your husband would never oh, let you forget, <laughs> would never forget that you were a woman. And, and so there was like this direct recognition that, you know, don't worry, going to work isn't going to, to ruin your identity as a woman. And so how do we get men to go into the types of jobs that are being created and, and tell them, Hey, don't worry, you're still a guy. You still you know, you're, this is not a threat to your masculinity. And there was this really beautiful piece that was done on PBS after my column where they interviewed me, but they found a guy who teaches preschool and they showed him out with the kids and they were doing a woodworking activity. He was, you know, playing with them and, you know, playing sports with them. So I'm not saying like, you know, oh, the only way to be masculine is for the preschool teacher to do woodworking and to play sports. but it was nice that they showed that not every aspect of being a preschool teacher is helping, you know, change a kid's diaper or, you know, clean up after an accident in the bathroom or, you know, reading it to them in a circle. But they're, these jobs are rich and there's a lot of different ways to think about them. And there's a lot of ways to make them your own, depending on what your own personal identity is and who you want to be. And so it, that's created for me, you know, just opened up the way we're going to need to think about this if we want to make sure that we don't see these big drops in less educated men participating in the labor force, because that's where the drops have been biggest is men who don't have a college degree aren't mm -hmm. working as much. There's lots and lots of reasons for that. This isn't the only one, but this is one where we keep, you know, sort of pushing in one direction, and maybe we need to start thinking about how to push it in a different direction. And this is particularly painful for men without college degrees, without a lot of education, right? They're the ones probably most affected by this this development. I think that's right, and partially because they're, you know, they, uh, you know, that they're they haven't seen, they haven't had examples of masculinity. Um, that have shown, you know, in their lives that have sort of shown more nurturing and caregiving. Um, so they have sort of more traditional notions of masculinity. And then there's still said the types of jobs being created for people without a college degree are increasingly in the service sector and increasingly mm. involved caring for others. Yep. This reminds me, and I think it's tied into the, the work of David Otters on job polarization, where Several articles he points out 
you know, that there's really a, a segmenting of the labor market where you have these there's growth in really high skilled jobs and and low skilled jobs and not much in the middle. And and for these you know, these men who don't have the the college education, the high skill sets, they're not going to get those jobs at the high end. So they're going to be getting the ones in the low end, which are, as you said, service jobs, uh, ones you know, a lot of interaction with people, and they may have a hard time continuing contending with that. Um, but it is where the job market is going. So you know, for better or for worse, men are going to have to adapt. So so some of it, you know, some of it is definitely that that there's a hollowing out of middle skill jobs. Mm -hmm. And, but I don't think that the only issue is around pay. I mean, you do see that in some of these service sector jobs or caring jobs, the pay starts lower than they, their entry might've been in say manufacturing job, but the, the growth, the wage trajectory is much steeper in these caring jobs than in the manufacturing jobs. And, you know, again, I, I mean, this is an anecdote, but like the guy they interviewed on this PBS show, he's like, you know, he said that he made $50,000 a year, which is pretty much a middle skill, you know, uh, a job in the middle. Mm -hmm. And um, he pointed out how he was able to take, you know, side work during the summers and uh, as well. So, you know, salary wasn't a thing holding him back. Uh, and his thought was that many people had, you know, misconceptions, you know, as that polarization is happening, we are also seeing the, you know, some of these jobs like childcare workers, there are some who are well compensated and some who aren't, and, you know, and that's also related to skill, you know, yep. well compensated yeah. childcare professionals tend to be more professional and have more skills. And then there are less compensated ones who are working in a you know less professional setting that requires fewer skills. All right, so that's the first explanation going back to our original my my original point there of our original observation that there's been this decline in, in prime age working men. So this this first point is that you know men need to adapt, be willing to do more girly jobs as, as you framed it. Another explanation that has come out is a recent one by Eric Hurst and some co-authors, a recent 2017 paper, though he's made this argument before. The paper is titled Leisure, Luxury, and the Labor Supply of Men. And I'm going to read an excerpt from an article um, describing their work. And the, the general thrust of it is that men are playing more video games. They've gotten so great, they've actually pulled us out of the, the labor force. And you know, I'm not sure if the causality is really established in this article. Is it you know, that because I don't have a job, I, I find the game more enticing, or is the game so enticing that I leave the labor force? But it's, it's fascinating. Just, I'll read some of the statistics here. The rise of gaming accounts for 23 to 46% of the decline in market work for younger men during the 2000s. Uh, for men ages 21 to 30, Hours worked fell by 12% between 2000 and 2015 compared to with the decline of 8% in hours worked for men 31 to 55. Um, quoting from the article, our estimates suggest that technology growth for computer and gaming leisure can explain as much as three quarters of the 4% greater decline for younger men. Do you buy this? Is, is this a, a, a reasonable explanation or are we uh, kind of pushing on a really small finding here? Well, let me start by saying that I think this raises really interesting questions mm -hmm. about um, why do we want GDP growth in the first place? And is GDP growth always a good thing? Because, you know, I, I, it is, I think one of the biggest puzzles of our time is why, uh, you know, of our era is why do we work so much um, when we're so rich? You know, Keynes thought we would all work less and then, enjoy less stuff and then take more of our increased wealth in the form of increased leisure. And, you know, if, if everybody in the United States decided that we should each take two weeks more vacation, our GDP would decline, but I wouldn't necessarily think that would be a bad thing. Um, so he's sort of saying people are working less because they're just having so much darn fun that it's not worth it to them to work. And that's, I guess we have then the question is, are they making a mistake or is this a good thing? And 
you know, so the rise of behavioral economics does, you know, indicate, is there an issue in which it's sort of addictive or they're doing short run thinking instead of long run thinking? Um, you know, the myopia is taking over. So is there a problem? Um, and, or, you know, is this a legitimate choice, like staying home to care for your children? And I mean, I'm sure that just offended like a million people. But um, <laughs> That's all right. But the, you know, that's how they frame this is that, that video games have gotten so awesome that you want to spend more time doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. If that's the case, then it raises a real question as to whether there's a problem. I'm not sure I quite buy it. I, you know, I think that there's, you know, that it, it's really hard to know whether which caused which, you know, once you can't find work, you got to fill your time with something. And, um, and so if they're filling their time with video games, cause they can't find work instead of, I don't, you know, whatever it is people used to do to fill their time before, you know, that's just a switch in sort of leisure activities. And I, I think it can be really hard for us to measure sort of what's leisure and what's not. I think the nice thing about video games is we're all pretty confident that that's leisure and nothing else. But I, I, I find it hard. I find it hard to believe that we just had a shock to leisure that's so great that we finally convinced a generation of people to consume a whole heck of a lot more of it. Um, that seems to be the claim that's being made, but I think we need a lot more evidence before we think that's true. Yeah, it just occurred to me this would be, if it's true, this would be some kind of evidence for real business cycle theory, right? <laughs> kind of a, a great vacation there, all these men are taking. And I, I know this piece has gotten a lot of pushback too, um, from, from different people. And I know as Smith wrote a piece in Bloomberg View, he didn't buy it. So it's, it's still interesting. And it's true video games have gotten great, but have they really gotten that great? So we've looked at men adapting to the new types of jobs. We've been looking at, you know, are men taking more leisure? Another potential explanation, this comes from your work, is the decline of trust. And you have an article in Bloomberg View yourself, and it's titled, Want to help the economy learn to trust? I'm going to do, read an excerpt from this. You write, five years ago, Justin Wolfers and I examined data showing that trust in institutions such as Congress, banks, and big business had plummeted during the recession, hitting an all-time low. Because historically trust had fallen as unemployment rose, we argued that it would increase as unemployment declined. We were wrong. Despite all the progress the economy has made, measures of trust remain stuck at historically low levels. Worse, people are losing faith in one another. One long-running survey shows that only 30% of Americans believe most people can be trusted, down from 46% in 1972. Young people are the most disillusioned. Only one in five millennials believe that most people can be trusted. That was very sobering. Uh, last part here, trust is essential to the economy, you write. Without it, people have a harder time figuring out with whom they can trade or work or even go on a date. As a result, they're more likely to miss beneficial opportunities Research has shown in the aggregate less trust leads to lower gross domestic product. So do you see a decline in trust being an important part of the story? Yes, yeah, so I worry a lot about the decline in trust. Um, I think that it makes it harder for people to find jobs. I I gave a, a talk um, a few years ago where I was talking about how hard it was for workers who were long term unemployed to find work. And that I thought, you know, that that part of this was that there's so little trust right now that everybody needs a validator to be able to get their foot in the door. And, you know, I had a woman come up to me who was just in tears afterwards who said that she was looking for a job and she had had many other previous experiences of unemployment in her life. And she had never had such a hard time getting people to uh, consider her without her knowing somebody inside the company who could speak up for her. So, you know, this, this, this question is, I mean, we see that jobs have relied on personal referrals for a long time, um, but it, it's almost like they're even, you know, but, but what, and what we currently see is that there are really big declines in trust and it, it makes it so that you only want to do business with people in your community. You only want to do business with people where, you know, somebody can vouch for them. And then there's an increase in 
you know, people needing to take security steps. You know, they use more contracts, more lawyers. They're more likely to, you know, jump to contract like talk or legal uh, battle like talk. And this, you know, just this lack of communication is a problem for us as a civil society, but I think it's also a problem for us for, in terms of economic growth. Um, you know, we we grow by coming up with new ideas. Innovation, a lot of innovation is about coming up with a new idea, and you come up with new ideas when you are willing to take risks. And in order to take risks, you have to have some broad level of trust. So I think the decline in trust is something that is, you know, tied to reductions in in growth and will continue to present problems. Yeah, I, I, I find that a very compelling argument. And, and I actually want to come back to your original article where you made this, not the Bloomberg, but the actual paper. And it was titled Trust in Public Institutions Over the Business Cycle. I'm looking at the chart and you do see this sharp decline. If you look in the time series, the sharp decline in trust in, in the different entities. You look at banks, Supreme Court, newspapers, Congress, big business. And I wonder if this decline, because it begins around 2008, right? It, time of the recession. It, it's not to me a coincidence that it happens to go down then. And what you point out in your Bloomberg View article, it hasn't fully, hasn't gone back up. But I, I wonder if that's a reasonable thing because the recovery has been so weak. I mean, going back to, you know, we talked about earlier, have we really measured slack properly? Um, the, the decline in potential GDP. I mean, th- there's just a sense of, um, you know, lack of dynamism in the economy. Things haven't, the recovery hasn't been where it normally would be. Maybe the counterfactual here is what if we had had a robust recovery, one more in line with other ones? Would trust have picked up more? Um, I, you, you look at like Europe where there's, there's been populism and the U.S. has been populism. Both of these places had really severe recessions with slow anemic recoveries. Maybe it's just, it's just the way it is given the state of the economy. Any thoughts on that? I think it's really hard to know whether, you know, I think it's it's hard to know whether this is the state of the economy didn't um, help facilitate a restoration of trust or whether the sharp decline in trust held back the uh, um, held back the economic recovery. It is, you know, I. I agree that, you know, potential GDP is not back where it should be. There are, there's still evidence that, you know, we could continue to see um, further employment growth and we'd like to see more GDP growth. But, you know, the unemployment rate came down much faster than forecasters expected. And some of the, you know, some of the decline in the GDP growth is due to the fact that the population is aging and we're going to have uh, fewer, you know, the, you know, a lot of the decline in labor, labor force participation rate is due to the aging of the population. And so if we sort of adjust growth based on the working age population, it's not quite as anemic, you know, as it otherwise would be. So, you know, I, I don't know, I'd like to be optimistic that if the economy continues on the same path for the next two years, that trust will start to rebound. But I don't see any evidence that we're headed in Mm -hmm. that direction. We seem to be headed in the opposite direction. Um, More polarization, uh, less trust. We have, you know, we've we've lost a sense of what's what's facts and what's not fact and whether facts even matter. Even, you know, I have students who come to me you know, they're studying to, they're getting their master's in public policy. And, you know, I tell them, you have to know what you're saying. Like, you have to say things that are true and you you have to get your facts right. And they're now coming to me and being like, do I, do I really like, does anybody actually care? I, I, that, that stuff really scares me. And it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it signals to me that when it comes to trust, um, the rate of change or the direction of change is pointed still in the wrong direction. So I would believe your story more <laughs> if it was a slow recovery mm-hmm. in trust, but at least we were going in the right direction, just, you know, very anemically. Mm-hmm. But I see us continuing to go in the wrong direction. I don't think people, I don't see any signs that people trust Congress more today than they did uh, six months ago or a year ago or two years ago. I don't see signs that they, you know, trust 
uh, that they're trusting each other more. You know, the, those things seem to be going in the wrong direction. And I think what, you know, it's not just about our politics, which have become particularly vitriolic, but it's, it's, you know, I want people to realize that that's bad for just everyday life. That's bad for being able to trust a guy to fix your car. Uh, it's bad for being able to hire somebody and come to mow your lawn. Uh, it's, you know, bad to be able to have, you know, just the sort of everyday transactions. And, you know, one of the things that helps with economic growth is if we can cut out transaction costs and what's happening with the, with the decrease in trust is we're increasing transaction costs. That's a nice way of framing it. I like that. Transaction costs have gone up with the decline in trust. You know, I, I, I guess going back to the point I was trying to make earlier is that I wonder if we'd gone back in time and look around the Great Depression. Was there kind of a, a slow recovery in trust coming out of that? Do, in other words, are are we susceptible to these declines in trust when the recessions are really deep and sharp? And I guess we probably don't have data to, to answer that question, or do we? I don't think we have data, okay. but I do think it's a good question. And um, but I, I don't, I don't think we know the answer. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think this, this is anecdotal, but you know, I, one thing comes to mind, for example, so we go into the great recession, there are very, which itself is a big shock. Lots of people are losing their jobs, very painful experience. And then you see what seems to be for most people, very radical things being done by government, big fiscal stimulus, Big things by the QE, big radical things done by the Fed, and and you know that what I'm talking about, the, the kind of response people are, they're getting, you know, and 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 President Obama was, I think, you know, vilified to an unfair extent because he just happened to be president during the time where we had this really sharp deep recession, and then we tried policies that normally aren't tried. It seems different. It seems strange. It's new. And, and and just kind of that, you know, you meant you mentioned, you know, the, the politics, how, how political we've become. We seem, we seem to live in silos. Um, I just wonder if, if some of that isn't the byproduct of how severe the Great Recession is. But on the other hand, you know, I I had Tyler Cowen on here recently, and we discussed his book, um, The Complacent Class, and, and he points out, you know, in some ways we're becoming more segregated in our society than ever by by income. <laughs> By sorting, um, as you've written about this as well, in terms of marriage and stuff, we're, we're you know we're sorting by likes and, and we're getting better at it. It's, it's rational on the individual level, but collectively it may have a cost, and maybe we don't get outside our bubbles. We don't trust people outside our bubbles. So, nonetheless, this, this trust is an important point you bring up. So, just to kind of recap, we've gone through the changing nature of jobs for men, which is a, a tough adjustment. Um, maybe some men are engaged in leisure. There's a decline in trust. I want to bring up another possibility here. And I recently had David Schleicher from Yale University, uh, Yale Law School on. And he's written a paper that, that kind of looks at and summarizes all the work that's been done on the decline on interstate migration in terms of labor. And, and he shows, it's not he's not original here, but he kind of puts it all together for me anyhow, that there's been this decline in interstate migration since about 1980. And moreover, specific groups have been less mobile than others. The ones that need to move are not moving. Um, the, the famous David Otter paper with his co-authors on the China shock is a good example of this. You know, the kind of the, the headline from that, that those papers were that you know the China shock was bigger than we thought it was originally. But kind of the I think the deeper, more interesting point it makes is that these people didn't move out of these communities that were hit by the China shock. You know, labor mobility has declined. So I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. The, the, the decline in labor mobility across regions within the U.S., is that a part of the story? So I, I worry a lot about the decline in dynamism, and that involves a, a bunch of different things. Some of it is the fact that there's less interstate migration among workers. And, and what that means is like a state-specific shock you know, if a state has something bad happen to it, like you just gave the example of like the China workers, it's going to take longer for that state to adjust to that shock, even though all the states around it are doing better. You know, it should be that, you know, if, if something bad happens to Connecticut, it should, you know, clear out very quickly as workers 
um, quickly adjust to the, the surrounding states. And so it gets absorbed into the whole U.S. economy. And that that's happening at a much slower rate. You also see like growth in establishment size. You see declines in um, you know, you see declines in the rate at which businesses uh, are created and destroyed. Um, we see declines in the rates at which people are changing jobs. And changing jobs is a really important source of wage growth. So, you know, in you know, in short, what we want, you know, in the when I was growing up as a young student, you know, college student in the early nineties learning about economics. People would say, oh, you know, the U.S. is such a dynamic labor market that people move, people change jobs, get raises, and that's why we're so much better than Europe. Because Europe is just a much more static labor market. Um, you know, if you find yourself without a job, you could be unemployed for a long time. It's hard for you to move to a better job. But the U.S., we just are constantly reallocating workers to their most productive use. And that's just not as true anymore. And if we're not reallocating workers to their more, most productive use, then that's going to mean slower growth. That's that's like mechanical. Um, so then the question is, does the decline in interstate migration and other forms of mobility mean that we're not reallocating people as well as we used to? Or is it that there's no need to reallocate people as much as there used to be? And I think that's the big outstanding question. And that's the question that answers how much this is hurting growth. And I don't know anyone who's really been able to nail um, down the answer to that question. Yeah. When I had this discussion with Tyler and with David Schleicher, I mean, there is some of this that is a, a rational welfare improving development from, you know, from people who might live in a city. They don't want people to move into their neighborhood. The land use regulations, um, they're protecting themselves, but they're, I guess my yeah, but that's bad for everybody. No, I no, I absolutely the the collective collectively it's a drain, right? But individually, yeah. it makes sense. And I know there's 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 disagreement on on what the prescription that falls out of this is. But land use regulation, occupational licensing, uh, no compete clauses, the lack of business dynamism you mentioned. And I know you guys worked on this at the CEA uh, when you were there. I find that to be very sobering. It, it, you know, to me, it's it's definitely. I, I look at that, and it seems to me, at least, to be a, 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 a development that is weighing down growth in the U.S. Well, to the extent that those are all the reasons, those would all be things that would weigh down growth for sure. There is another explanation, which is maybe we're doing a better job of finding good job matches today, and we don't need to cycle through as many jobs in order to find the right match for us. That's the positive story. I'm mm-hmm. not saying that is what's, set, what's happening. But if you thought that people were doing a better job, companies and workers were doing a better do- job of forming matches, then you would see a decline in, in reallocation that would be because we need to do less reallocation. And it would mean that we sort of had gotten some of our growth in the past by getting that matching process better today. Um, and we don't want to undo that, you know, but we're not going to get further growth from, you know, reallocating people because they're already sort of at their most productive use. But I think the things you brought up are things that I'm very worried about. And it, it, certainly the case that some of that holding back the, is holding mm-hmm. back growth. So we know, I mean, non-compete clauses are, you know, it's business, anti-competitive behavior and you know we just shouldn't allow it because if you don't have if workers can't move to jobs where they can make a higher salary then you know then then there's they have less of an incentive to invest in building the skills that will allow them to get that promotion at the next you know at the next company and there may not be enough growth within their one firm for everybody to get those kind of promotions. So we want people to be striving and to be climbing. And these non-compete clauses really, really limit that. The, and they're really anti-competitive. And occupational licensing is very anti-competitive. I mean, you know, who thinks it's a good idea to let people who are in an occupation prevent a bunch of other people from entering it, right? Right. <laughs> So we we did work on a lot of those issues at CEA because I think labor mobility is a really important part of 
of workers having, you know, bargaining power and being able to move into what they want to do and things that limit workers' mobility mm-hmm. limits their ability to get higher wages. And sometimes it benefits other workers, like with it, occupational licensing. And sometimes, you know, it, it benefits shareholders when it comes to businesses earning higher profits uh, because they can get away with paying workers less. Yeah. One of the takeaways I, I got from the discussion earlier about this is the U.S. may be coming less of an optimal currency area, right? You have the one-size-fits-all monetary policy, and it's kind of premised on, you know, there's fiscal transfers, but also labor mobility between regions. Now, to the extent that it's, this is a good development, like you mentioned, maybe people are finding the jobs easier, they don't need to move around as much, so maybe it's not a big deal. But to the extent that decline in labor mobility reflects these more adverse developments, um, it, it poses problems for the Federal Reserve down the road as well as economic growth. So, yeah, I think I think that's a funny question. I it it always puzzles me that the people are willing to question whether you know a single monetary union makes sense for Europe, and then they they look at you like you've grown three heads if you say, "Does it make sense for the United States?" Um, but it, you know, it, it is the same question. Um, I think you know what it does for us is it we have completely free trade across the states. You know, again, people who question international trade, they never question trade between Ohio and Michigan. And you know, one of the reasons one of the reasons we're allowed, you know, we have so much scope to question international trade as a society is because we have so much trade within our own borders because we have so many different states. You know, if you were a Rhode Island and you couldn't trade with any of the states around you, you would really, really want international trade. Um, you know, but the, uh, and the, one of the reasons why it's so important that we have a single currency is that also, you know, helps facilitate trade. We don't ask, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about what's the value of a dollar printed, uh, a San Francisco dollar versus a New York dollar. Yeah, absolutely. As you said earlier, this lowers transaction costs. I mean, the key idea here is transaction costs. The exactly. single currency definitely lowers transaction costs. And I'll be very clear. I don't think we are a non-optimal currency area. I just think we might be moving gradually away from being one on the margin if, in fact, all these adverse developments are the reason for the decline in liberal mobility. Well, our time is up, unfortunately. It's been a fun conversation today with Betsy Stevenson. Betsy, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was my pleasure. It was lots of fun to talk with you. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.